All right, it's uh, Sound Off with Sinkoff back at you. 104.5 The Team, ESPN Radio. I am Brian Sinkoff here with you. Pleasure. And it is a pleasure to be joined live in studio by Douglas Gladstone, uh, Saratoga resident now and the author of A Bitter Cup of Coffee, How MLB and the Players Association Threw 874 Retirees a Curve. Douglas, glad to see you past the security inspection to get into the Sound Off <laughs> studios, and you're here with us. So that's good. You have a clean record. Well, you know, I figure if Brendan Harris can uh, can do it, I can. That's Brian. right. And thank you very much for having me on the program. I really appreciate it. All right, uh, let's let's sort of give everybody the background of this book uh, as you look into the plight of 874 Major League Baseball players who played between 47 and 79, all with brief trials in the majors, and they are now really just long enough to drink a cup of coffee. But these guys left out in the cold. So, sort of explain the premise of your book here, Doug. No problem. Uh, for the benefit of you and your listeners. Uh, In 1947, Major League Baseball established the uh, Players' Pension Fund. You needed five years at that time to vest or to be eligible for a pension. In 47. In 1947. Uh, We uh, we fast forward 22 years, and that vesting requirement was lowered to four years. And then in 1980, um, there, if you recall, if you and your listeners recall, there was the threat of a player strike. Uh, the players actually went out. There were about 92 exhibition games canceled in um, uh, towards the end of spring training. But they came back to play. They were going to go out in Memorial Day weekend. And at the last minute, there was a deal. Um, and the nuclear issue of free agency um, was at the heart of this threat and strike. But one of the things that got negotiated... Uh, Ray Greeby was the owner's negotiator at the time. Marvin Miller um, was the executive director of the Players Union at the time. And Greeby offered Miller this great sweetheart of a deal. Right. One game for medical benefits and 43 games, basically a quarter of a season, to collect an annuity. And this happened when, in 80? Yeah, May of 1980. May of 1980. All right, so between so so it was a four-year, five-year window, four-year window. You had to be on an active roster, play in the majors for four years, and then you get the full benefits. That changed in 1980 because of that one instance. Is That's that right? That's correct. During the negotiations over the threat and player strike, uh, the, the carrot, as it were, was uh, to offer the union the one game of health insurance and 43 games for your retirement benefit. And what kind of uh, benefits do they get? Health insurance, everything's covered, right? Medi- all the medical. Uh, everything. In fact, it, it's pretty sad, Brian. Um, recently, as of May 13th, a, uh, a former Astro player named Jay Schlater just died. He, uh, he had a neurological impairment called ataxia. Hmm. He only had a cup of coffee. He was with the Astros, like I said. And his widow told me recently, we begged Major League Baseball. We just, we even offered Mr. Gladstone to pay the health insurance premiums if we could just get mm-hmm. part of the health insurance right. coverage. Right, beyond the plan, basically. Correct. And and Major League Baseball said no. Correct. Unbelievable. Um, all right, so... So now it's uh, these guys from, uh, I guess, the guys between 47 and 79 when it was the four- and five-year period were now not grandfathered in, that as it correct. were. They and, were not retroactively included, correct. And, and so here they go now. Since 1980, MLB players need one day of service for the health benefits and 43 days of service to be eligible for the retirement. But those former guys who played from 47 to 79 were not included retroactively, as you just said, and they get no pensions for the time they gave to the majors um and and let's be clear on this one day of service credit doesn't mean you play one game it just means you got to be on an active roster for one day that's correct and 43 days of service credit doesn't mean you have to play 48 games 43 days on an active roster that's correct you you could be steven strasberg with his 15.6 million dollar uh signing bonus and in 43 game days he's only going to be on the mound for about nine right so that's that what he would it would count. He's on Correct. the roster for four. So about basically a month and a half. Correct. You're on a major league team for a month and a half. All right. So what now gave you the idea? First of all, how did you find out about this? Um, but then that's part one. And then number two, what gave you the idea to write this book? Because I, I find it to be honest, I find it fascinating. This kind of stuff. Well, I appreciate I appreciate it. I really do. A lot of uh, there've been a nice a lot of reviews, the complimentary about the book. But let me take the first part of your question. Um, I uh, I just come off 
Uh, I know you guys are here are into popular culture. I just done a story on um, the MASH episode, Adam's Ribs, and it got published in the Chicago Sun-Times, and I had the pleasure of talking with the uh, late Larry Gelbart. So I'm sitting around the house, and my wife, of course, she says, well, you're pretty full of yourself now, aren't you? You've got published in the Ch Chicago Sun-Times. And she said, well, what are you going to do for an encore? And I rightly didn't know. I hadn't planned upon doing anything else. And um, I knew, however, that last year was the 40th anniversary of Tom Seaver's Imperfect Game. That was the night on July 9th, uh, 1969, when Tom Seaver carried a perfect game into the top of the ninth inning. He got a Randy Hundley on a comebacker to the mound. And a little-known rookie, a converted outfielder named Jimmy Qualls of the Chicago Cubs. He was only playing because the regular center fielder, Don Young, was being benched that day by uh, the late Leo DeRocher. Uh, Jimmy lined a clean single in between Cleon Jones and Tommy Agee, and the perfect game was over. I got to thinking, well, you know, Seaver is a Hall of Famer, first ballot Hall of Famer, um, has 115 acres of prime Napa Valley country in Calistoga, California. He's done, you know, all right for himself. Jimmy Qualls, not so much. Jimmy Qualls, in fact, when I started the research of my book, uh, he, like a lot of people in this country, uh, was just trying to scrape enough money together to pay for his health insurance premiums. How did you know to look up, not to interrupt you, how did you know to look up Qualls of all people? Uh, how did you know to look that guy up? That's a very good question. Uh, baseball Almanac is the friend of any investigative <laughs> journalist or freelance writer. Um, and I remembered Jimmy Qualls. I remembered... I wasn't actually at Chase Stadium that night, but I, you know, if you're a New York Met fan, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. this is a team that still hasn't had a perfect game or a no-hitter uh, pitched for them in, in their storied year. Um, I remember Jimmy Qual. So I got a hold of him. I pitched the idea first to Baseball Digest, and they uh, said, go ahead with it. It sounds like a great idea. And I was talking to Jimmy. Very casually, very innocently, he mentions to me... You were just talking to him, just, hey, what's your life up like to I'm, now? Like I'm talking let's, to you let's right do now. A, let's do a, uh, hey, where have you been since type exactly. of story. That's okay. exactly what the angle was. Gotcha. And Jimmy very casually mentions to me, you know, I had a good cup of coffee in, in the show, Mr. Gladstone. I don't really resent anything. I wish my career had been longer. But the only thing I'm really mad about is I don't get a pension. Hmm. And in the interest of full disclosure... To you and your listeners, um, I happen to work during the day for the New York State Retirement System. Okay. So I know a little bit about vesting. I know a little bit about pension eligibility. And my first question to Jimmy was, well, what makes you think you're entitled to a pension, right. Jimmy? Because, you know, you clearly don't have the service time. And he says, it's not as cut and dry as all that. Mm -hmm. And he proceeded to tell me that in 1980, they did not retroactively amend the requirement. In October of 1997, they decided to give uh, life annuities, charitable donations, as it were, to all those ball players, the pre-1947 players, who obviously didn't pay into the pension fund. And then most significantly, they gave life annuities, charitable payments to the veterans of the Negro Leagues, who, strictly speaking, no matter how nice this was a gesture on the part of Major League Baseball to make up for the segregation that right. occurred and robbed a lot of these talented ball players from being their, in the majors, right? From being in the majors, they had no employment contractual relationship. Mm -hmm. It would be equivalent. I'll give you an analogy. I don't know what you know your corporate parent what the uh, pension eligibility is here, but uh, if you and Alan, for whatever reason, didn't meet the terms of the uh, eligibility and then i came along and i got a pension how would you feel because they changed the rules after i left or whatever right right yeah um so here these guys are they the, the, he explained to you hey this is the story here's why i don't get a pension so right. then at that point what it snowballed the idea snowballed for you well the idea didn't exactly take off because um you know major league baseball is a very formidable foe and there was uh, a class action lawsuit in 2003 that pretty much got thrown out of court in May of 2006. Uh, it didn't go anywhere. And, you know, I had to basically convince myself to do this story. You're tackling Major League Baseball. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I'm, uh, like I said at the outset, I've been heavily influenced. I'm a child of the television generation. And I remember 
The Fugitive. You remember the old yes. 50s show? Mm-hmm. All right. Well, I wanted the scales of justice just. 